Well, it's Wednesday, and that, of course, means Faith Nation. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We have got a big show ahead, Jenna. But before we even get to the show, I want to make sure, can we make sure the pockets, am, am I covering the How's pocket? How's it looking? Is it all right? I think it's does, good, Does the right? computer? I think you're good. Okay, make good. sure the computer's not hiding it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jenna. You're good. All right, we're going to go to the White House, uh, by the way, in this uh, half hour or 40 minutes, or it could go on for four hours. Uh, we'll go to the White House to talk tax reform with the President's Director of Legislative Affairs. That's Mark Short. We're also going to have the latest on why Senator Jeff Flake won't be seeking re-election. Hello. And Amber C. Strong. We'll find out what the C stands for, but also we'll get out of the social seat for a few minutes. She's actually going to get out of the seat to bring us uh, <laughs> fake or fact about news networks, and I cannot wait for that. But first, a big national event last night, yeah, That's right. Revive Us 2 hit movie theaters coast to coast. Mm. Kirk Cameron, many of you know and love him. He hosted the event at the brand new Museum of the Bible here in Washington D.C. And it was a part. Uh, it was you know it was a night, David, of yeah. of prayer and worship and also discussion. You know, in a time when there is so much division in our country, Kirk says this is really one way to unite all of us. He teamed up with several big names like Ben Carson and Ravi Zacharias hmm. and a lot of others. I actually sat down with Kirk before the event to talk about the awakening he says he sees happening in America and how he hopes God can use him. Take a look. Hmm. You say an awakening is happening in our country. What do you mean by that? Well, when the negative narrative floods our news feeds that says we're divided, we're arguing, we're fighting, we're, we're so politicized that we can't move forward, I travel around the nation and have visited over 30 cities a year for the last eight years teaching marriage and family conferences. And I find that there's a different story that others are not talking about. There has been a massive shift in our culture recently. I feel a fresh momentum that's building and an awakening of people who are saying, I can see that what we're trying to do is not working in our country. It's not moving in the direction that we'd hope. And so, let's lean into our faith. Let's love God with all of our heart. And they want to love their wives, their husbands, their kids. And they want to be the hands and feet of Jesus, reaching out to their neighbors, no matter how different they are from themselves. Uh, this is very encouraging and very exciting to me. And I want to amplify that. And I want to broadcast it to the nation and invite the whole family of faith to participate. Well, I have to ask you, because so many evangelicals talk about it, but do you think that awakening has anything to do with this current administration and, and, and God using maybe some unlikely people to bring about His will? You know, when I read in the Bible, and here we are at the Museum of the Bible, and there are floors dedicated to the miraculous stories of the things that God has done in the most unlikely of times. And we right now are in the middle of the biggest story of all being played out on the greatest stage uh, ever, and that is the, 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 the world. And history is truly God, it's his story. And right now, I, I think that we live in a very interesting time. And so during times of anxiety, we selected uh, the leader of our country and God will use uh, leaders in politics. He'll use leaders in uh, our educational organizations. He'll use leaders in the church. He'll use moms and dads and leaders in every area of influence to accomplish his will. And I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he works all those pieces together. But I know that, um, as my pastor says, when we can't understand and trace the hand of God, why is he doing this? Why did he let that happen? Why is this person in charge? Or, or why didn't that happen? We can always trust his heart mm -hmm. because he's good and he's in control. And his ways are higher. His ways are perfect. Kirk, how did you know that this is what God wanted you to do? Some people talk about hearing a still small voice or, or hearing from God. I've never heard a voice myself. I don't have a, a crystal ball. I, have, I wouldn't believe it if I saw something in a, in a piece of glass. But I, I find that God opens doors and, and, and gives you great desires to do things for his kingdom and for his glory. And for me, I've always responded to that by walking through the door and trusting that the door will close if, if, uh, if there's a better door to go through. And in my, in my walk with God, I've found that whenever I seek to honor God and be a blessing to other people, if that, 
intersects with uh, my acting career or an ability to make a live event or a movie like Revive Us, I want to be all in and I do it with all my heart. And that's why I'm so excited about Revive Us and all the work that's put into this national family meeting. I'm, I'm assuming that there will be uh, 150,000 people or more, just like there was last year, gathering for a night of hope, courage, and unity. And I know uh, as, as a husband and a father of six, why is it so important, do you think, that we have this conversation about faith and hope and courage today? One of the things that I learned at Revive Us last year from Eric Metaxas, who wrote an amazing book on Dietrich Bonhoeffer and recently a biography about Martin Luther, said, there's such a thing that our founding fathers talked about called, um, well, he called it the golden triangle of freedom. And so you ask about the importance of faith in, uh, in our culture, especially with our children. If we want to have freedom, our founders understood that freedom is only possible if the people have virtue. Because if you don't have virtue and you don't do what's right and good, then your freedom gives you license to uh, act wickedly. So virtue is necessary for freedom. And in order to have real virtue, it, you need genuine faith in God. Because without faith in God, the heart is deceitful, as the Bible says, and, and we're bent towards selfishness. So we won't have the virtue needed to have the responsibility that goes with freedom. And that faith itself must be free. It can't be coerced by the government and forced on somebody. It must be free. But the freedom requires virtue, which requires faith, which requires freedom. And that's the golden triangle. I want to teach my kids that. If my kids don't understand the importance of faith, uh, we will soon no longer be free. Free to sit here and have interviews like this, have freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to worship God and make museums like the, free, like the Museum of the Bible. So it's super important. Kirk Cameron, thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you very it. much. Kirk Cameron. Kirk Cameron with uh, Jenna Browder, or mm -hmm. other way around. Anyhow, uh, so you were at this event last night, Revive yep. Us. Uh, I was yep. at home in my pajamas having empanadas. What were you doing? <laughs> By the way, those looked very good. Well, thank you very much. Shall we yep. post that, Shoshana? We, no, we don't have a picture. I, I didn't see any photos picture. of that. No, I, I was there, though, actually, with some friends, yeah. and it was just uh, so much fun. It really, um, it really was an uplifting night. Mm -hmm. It was. And, uh, and I think the thing that I was uh, most taken by were mm -hmm. some of the guests, uh, probably Ravi Zacharias. Mm -hmm. He was just, I mean, he was bringing it. He was preaching it. On you know fire. what I mean? He was on fire. And I have a quote fire. here. Um, he was talking about, you know, the problems that our world faces today and how it really starts at the individual level. Mm -hmm. And he had this quote. He said, until the heart is changed, hate will remain inside. That yeah. is the truth of the gospel. So, you know, it's really, um, it's a heart problem. It's a heart problem yep. that our culture, that our world faces. And, uh, yeah, so they just talked about that and so many other issues facing families, facing just our culture and our world today. It was an incredible night. Well, that sounds neat. And Amber, what do you got over there? What, what are they saying? Well, apparently Jenna wasn't the only one that felt this way. We had a couple of you guys um, weigh in on the entire experience. And mm -hmm. this one comes in from Marsha. She says, so great to worship together. Kirk, that was just awesome. Thank you for uplifting us and uniting us with Jesus. Uh, and this next one comes in from Rose. Love it when KC... Kurt Cameron. Hey. Uh, They're tight. <laughs> calls together a family meeting. Hashtag forever family. Hashtag people of the cross. So apparently people felt that the same way as you did, uh, Jenna. That's great. And we had this one just come in from Daly who asked, is there a second showing? Well, guess what, uh, Daly? If you missed Revive Us uh, again uh, last night, then you can catch it again. There is an encore showing on November 1st. So yeah. there you go. Very nice. For, for information on that, I believe it's reviveus.com. Tickets, show times, all the information you need. Very nice. Revivus.com. Well, very nice. Amber, we'll see you a bit later. Yeah, thanks, Amber. Uh, I'll be called DB from now on, JB, okay. KC, mm -hmm. and the Sunshine Band. <laughs> no, <laughs> I went there, Amber. I know. That was for you, Amber. Thank you. All right, coming up, uh, the White House Director of Legislative Affairs. His name is Mark Short. He's going to join us to talk tax reform and how the president plans to get his agenda passed. Good luck with that. Back in a moment. Israel and the Middle East center of the world for thousands of years and still creating headlines that reach back to the Bible. Hosted by award-winning correspondent Chris Mitchell, Jerusalem Dateline brings a Christian perspective to events that literally change history, whether it's the front lines 
or underground. Jerusalem Dateline is your window to Israel, Jerusalem, and the Middle East. Contact us at the address on your screen. All right, uh, welcome back, everybody. We're still here. Sorry about that, liberals. Hey, tax reform is a top priority for the Trump administration, but the $64,000 question, Jenna, what is it? Hold on, let me look on prompter. Uh, that's right. Here's a $64,000 question. Can they turn a priority into a reality? I'm yeah. nothing without prompter. You know, it's a good question. Yes, if they you. do, this would be the first big legislative achievement mm -hmm. under, the, under President Trump. Earlier today, we went over to the White House to talk to Mark Short. He's the White House director for legislative affairs, and essentially, he's the liaison between the White House and lawmakers as they try to strike a deal. Here's our interview. Mm -hmm. Mark Short, thanks for joining us. Jen, thanks for having me on. Uh, let's get right to it. When it comes to tax reform, how likely do you think it is that Congress will have a bill on the president's desk by the end of the year? Well, we're certainly aiming for the end of this year. We think it's important because we need to get this economy going. During the last eight years of the Obama administration, our economy grew an average of 1.8 percent. That's the lowest of any president since the Great Depression. And it's time to get this economy churning again and begin to create jobs to the American people. And so it's important not for political reasons. It's important for the economy that we do this sooner rather than later. And our aim is to do it before the end of this year. Mark, let me ask you a little bit about the stumbling blocks here. Is there one big one? Uh, give me a sense of what's going to be the challenge here getting this thing done. Well, I think our challenge, David, is right now Congress is so broken along partisan lines. We think there's a lot of reasons that many of the Democrats would want to support tax relief, mm -hmm. particularly not just because it's focused on middle-income families, but also because lowering the corporate rate will help to create jobs and keep jobs here in America. So, many, so much of the industrial Midwest has lost jobs overseas because companies have inverted to, and moved their, their headquarters to other countries that have much lower tax rates. Mm -hmm. And we've simply fallen behind. So normally I think it's an attractive piece, but I think right now we're, we're so broken as a country on partisan lines, the Democrats don't want to give this president a victory, even though they know the policy is better for them. What about on the Republican side, though? Uh, this is the bless your heart part of the question with uh, Rand Paul, bless his heart. But he's a tough vote to get. And now with Jeff Flake and Bob Corker saying some pretty provocative things, does that make it even more difficult here? Well, we're hopeful we'll get Rand Paul's support on this. I, I think that uh, the president does enjoy a close relationship with Rand. We were certainly disappointed that, on, for instance, on the health care, it was our best chance for entitlement reform and really to protect really a significant number of pro life measures in that bill to make sure that taxpayer dollars are not going to fund abortion. Mm -hmm. So we were disappointed that Rand Paul, who's somebody who, who I think advocates for life, wasn't with us on that vote. Mm -hmm. That was our best opportunity. We hope he'll be with us, though, on tax reform. Mark, fill in the blank. Tax reform happens if? Uh, I think tax relief happens if the American people let their members of Congress know that they need it right now. Mm -hmm. That's what that's it. Inevitably, that's what members of Congress listen to. And if the American people speak up and say, we need to get this done, not just because it'll help middle income families, but again, it'll help keep jobs here in our country. I want to switch over to uh, Obamacare for a quick yeah. second. This repeal and replace, okay, the media thinks the train's left the station, it's not happening. What is, what is your sense? Are we going to see this be revisited here uh, next year, maybe even later this year? Well, David, uh, the Republicans have made a promise to the American people for six years that when given the chance, they will repeal it. We obviously fell short this year by one vote, and we're very disappointed in that. But the president's not going to give up. So we will come back in 2018 and have that fight again. We think it's important to, to deliver on that promise. We think Americans are getting hurt by Obamacare. We also are very concerned about many of the social causes inside of Obamacare. Again, taxpayer dollars going to fund abortions is a policy that this administration does not support. So we'll be coming back to it next year. You bridge the gap between the White House and Capitol Hill. Talk about your strategy in doing that. Well, Jenna, I think that honestly, in, in many cases, it's where the um that's where your, uh, your agenda is aligned. And the American people elected this president because they want to make sure that America is secure. They want to make sure that tax relief is provided. And they've been tired of the dysfunction in Washington for so long. And many of our partners in Congress are ones who recognize that. And in many cases, it's people who have been successful in business. So for instance, David Perdue has been one of our greatest champions up in the Senate on Capitol Hill because I think he comes from the private sector. He's been a very successful CEO of, of several companies. And so he, he gets where we're trying to go. And that's usually the, the challenge we have on Capitol Hill is so many of the elected career politicians maybe don't understand the same thing that those who have served in the private sector do. A couple last questions before we let you go. Uh, what's more frustrating for you, the, 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 the Chuck and Nancy show, you know, the Democrats or, you know, some of these rogue Republicans? I mean, whether it be Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski and Rand Paul and some other folks, John McCain, 
Uh, what's been a bit more frustrating or perplexing for you? You know, David, I think we have to step back and appreciate how blessed we are to have these jobs and have the chance to serve the American people. And I think in many cases, even members of Congress, we have to recognize that they often believe that they're doing what they think is in the best interest of their constituents. And we just have to make a more compelling case as to why our agenda matches with what's good for their states. So I don't know that it's so much of a frustration. I think that there's certainly a dysfunction in this town. And I think that dysfunction is what propelled Donald Trump to the presidency. They wanted an outsider to come in because they were tired of things not getting accomplished. And, and that, that naturally is going to create friction. And that's where we are right now at this moment in American history. On the topic of faith, talk about how Oliver North has had a huge impact in that part of your life. We read it online. It's got to be true. <laughs> yeah, it's right? online. Right? Well, you know, Jen, I, I've shared that uh, I was very fortunate to get a chance to work for Ali. And I was somebody who, uh, who I think had been easy to walk away from my faith. And then uh, when I was uh, surrounded by uh, a Marine who had been decorated with multiple Purple Hearts, the Silver Star, and I was working for him as a young man in my 20s, and I saw him in an accountability group or prayer group hugging other men who were holding him accountable. It certainly changed my perspective of what's missing in my life. And so uh, that was a very impactful time for me, and I certainly credit Ali for helping to, uh, to lead me on a path to Christ. And Mark Short at the White House. It was great to be there today. Yeah, it really was. And what was nice to see is a guy, I mean, look, he's kind of a voice of reason. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. he's very, very articulate and, and very, um, you know, it doesn't seem like he's like a flamethrower, bomb, bomb thrower, or anything no. like that. But he's mm -hmm. got a hard job, Jenna. I mean, you know, yeah. talk about shepherding legislation between the Trump administration and yeah. the White House. Yeah, good luck with that. Degree of difficulty 10.0. You know, that yeah. is, yeah. But if, he, but if he gets tax reform, I'll get the gold medal. Hey, um, no kidding. The, the, the payoff could be big. It could be big. Yeah. And uh, I thought it was interesting. Uh, uh, yes, I know where you're going. You, you know where I'm going? Well, yeah. then go ahead and say it then. Because I don't well, know what I'm saying. No, okay, so we, so we wrapped up that interview. Yeah. And uh, he was doing another hit. Do we say the network? Sure, let's say the network. Okay, it was MSNBC, liberal MSNBC. Right. And uh, he's going over there. <laughs> you take the rest. Oh, thanks for, yeah. So he's going over there and, uh, well, basically said, yeah, so I'm not quite sure how this is going to go. And I said, well, we'll be praying for you. And uh, <laughs> He got a kick out of that. Yeah, he thought that was funny. Uh, I said it in jest, ha ha, laugh, laugh. But, um, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. yeah, you go on MSNBC. I've been, I've been, I've been on with Chris Jansen over there. And, uh, yeah, hello. Uh, laying on a hands, and sometimes it was a little bit, no, it wasn't laying on hands like that, but uh, <laughs> it's intense. Yeah, you got to have some thick skin. Yeah, yeah, but, but he thick seems skin. like uh, he, he can handle it. I think he's, yeah. I'm not sure if he wants to go on with Chris Cuomo at, at points at, with CNN, but Ooh, Cuomo yeah. sometimes gets on a little bit. Another of tough one. Uh, yeah, well, and he's a soliloquy guy, and he, he does the soapbox thing, and, mm -hmm. you know, is it news, is it opinion, and with Chris Cuomo, you're never quite sure what you're going to get, <laughs> so uh, mm -hmm. I, just like... The show, well, in a way. Listen, I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of Mark Short. Yeah, kind of like the show. Yeah, sorry. I'm looking over at Amber. You know, cut to the three shot because she's laughing when I say you never know what you're going to get. She's trying to keep it in over here. Go ahead. What are you saying? You know me too well. I, you know me too. We've worked together way too long. You're yes. like, oh, it's a little bit of a soliloquy, and I'm like, like the one you're on now. That's what you said. <laughs> You said All it. Right, that's well, all in love because we love each other. Yes, that's right. Uh, Put that in air quotes. Yeah. Well, Amber, you have a you have a great piece for us coming up after the break. I do, I do. So we, the president tweeted about uh, network news and just kind of saying about revoking the licenses. So what we're going to do is kind of dive into the FCC. How does the FCC work? And when it comes to the so-called fake news networks, mm. how do licensing work? So it's an interesting piece. Just stick with me on it, okay? Okay. We'll be right back. Back in a moment. I want it to be God. I want it to be Christ. Hey there. Make sure you check out my new uplifting Christian entertainment show, Studio 5. Distracted by those Ephraim Graham promos. I know. Gosh, just, it's so slick. He's so snappy. So snazzy. Snazzy and snappy. And yeah, just uh, so sophisticated, right? That's the triple Why S. Why do you agree? That's the Why triple S. Agree? Snappy, snazzy, and sophisticated. Triple threat. Triple Hello. S. All right, so Mitch McConnell, John McCain, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, Ephraim Graham, they all, no, not Ephraim Graham, but they all represent just a handful of senators that have faced personal attacks from President Trump. Yeah, you know what, though? They are not the only ones. On Tuesday, <laughs> Arizona Senator Jeff Flake announced he will not seek re-election, citing the president's behavior. The behavior. Ooh. Flake is one of the senators Trump has gone after in the past, and now 
now he's calling on the president to change his ways. Have a look. Such behavior does not project strength because our strength comes from our values. It instead projects a corruption of the spirit and weakness. It is often said that children are watching. Well, they are. And what are we going to do about that? When the next generation asks us, why didn't you do something? Why didn't you speak up? What are we going to say? Mr. President, I rise today to say enough. Ooh, tough words from Senator Jeff yeah, Lake. Sure. Well, Ben Kennedy is live at the White House with reaction from the administration. Hey, Ben. Well, good afternoon, Dave and Jenna. I just heard Je uh, Senator uh, Jeff Flake talk about there. He continues to trade jabs with the president on social media, this time uh, tangling with them on Twitter. Senator Bob Corker specifically, let's focus on him for just a moment there. Corker said that he will never trust the president or never uh, back him again uh, and also called him utterly untruthful. Well, you bet this got a response from President Trump. He tweeted back at Senator Corker several times, the most recent one from this morning, calling out Senator Flake and Senator Corker, saying that they have a zero chance of getting reelected. Now, this kind of talk no doubt uh, highlights the division between President Trump and lawmakers, but it also uh, begs the big question is, can they get along to get stuff done on Capitol Hill? Well, Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders did respond. Take a listen. In any of this, does, does any of this make the president pause and wonder if he is doing anything wrong, that he bears any responsibility Look, again, for what I, these senators are saying is a breakdown of civility in our country. Look, I think the voters of these individual senator states are speaking uh, in pretty loud volumes. I think that they were not likely to be reelected. And I think that shows that the support is more behind this president than it is those two individuals. Look, you've got a, a, an individual in the president. He's a fighter. We've said it many times before. The people of this country didn't elect somebody to be weak. They elected somebody to be strong. And when he gets hit, he's going to hit back. And Sarah Huckabee Sanders is correct. President Trump is a fighter and he is hitting back on social media. But back to Senator Flake and Corker for just a moment here. They are not running for re-election. So quite frankly, they really don't have anything to lose by letting President Trump know how they feel. And in very nice terms, they are just not happy with the way he is running this country as the commander in chief. David, Jenna. Yeah, hey, Ben, what kind of impact, by the way, is the civil war the GOP going to have on getting tax reform passed on Capitol Hill? That's going to be an issue. Well, David, quite honestly, despite this feud, it appears that tax reform is still on schedule. The GOP hopes to have tax cuts complete or done uh, by the beginning of early next year, knowing that if they don't, they could pay the price in the 2018 elections. All right, Ben Kennedy for us live at the White House. Thank you, Ben. Amber Strong joins us now. Amber, what are people saying about this? Yeah, I think uh, yesterday we saw quite a bit of response from our viewers coming in and saying, mm -hmm. you know, some happy to see Flake go. And then you saw it was an interesting mixed bag because mm -hmm. you had some who were praising him like, yes, finally standing up to the president, someone from the GOP. But then you had others who said, if you truly feel this way and you truly want to help, stay and fight. Right. Why well, are you run. leaving? Exactly. So, and, and that begs, you know, that opens up the wider criticism of the fact that he had no chance at re-election. Right, so can right. I just say something, and, and I, I don't want to go off the rails here, but let me go a bit off the rails. Look, I, I know Jeff Flake to a degree, uh, and he's a rock rib conservative, okay, but here's the thing. He's going to go bold now when he's not running for re-election? Give me a break. I mean, to me, that just seems really, really weak. I mean, so, you know, why do you have to be different when you're running for re-election? In other words, basically what he's saying is if he was running for re-election, he couldn't say the things that he wants to say. Well, why can't you just say the things that you want to say when you're running for election? Trump did it, and look where, look where it ended him up, right? He's president of the United States. Mm -hmm. I guess my point is, is that it just feels this is exactly what Trump is complaining about. Politicians who are one thing on the campaign trail, and then if they're not really a politician, and they're out of the game like Jeff Flake wants to be, then all of a sudden he's going to be unplugged, and he's going to be this guy that's going to say anything. Why can't you just say anything when you're running for re-election? Well, yeah. clearly he doesn't want to. And, and this is what people are tired of. And, you know, so Jeff, Jeff Flake, 
Flake, you know, I, I don't know, give me a break, Jeff Flake. It rhymes. One word. One word. Authenticity. Hello. And you know, I think our world is so hungry for authenticity, whether it's in politicians or just people in general. You know, people um, people can see through it, and that is why Trump is in office. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. do you think, real question for yes. you, Brody. If, do not you a fake think question. That, not fake a fake fact? question. Right. This is a real question. Yeah. If more senators, if, if this notion, if this brewing, festering, um, mm -hmm disagreement with the president is present in the Senate mm -hmm. from GOP senators if more of them begin to be the flakes of the world, the sass of the world, and speak out, help or hurt? Well, it hurts the president, but I question whether or not they're actually going to speak out. So you have Ben Sass, you have Flake, you have Corker, you have some others, but ultimately Flake voted for uh, the uh, repeal and replace of Obamacare. Uh, Corker did too. Uh, Sass did as well. So, I mean, you know, you can speak out against the president, but also vote for common sense conservative legislation the way they see it. So, mm -hmm. so in policy, they're mm -hmm. lying in step with the president. Corker is. Yeah, I think Flake overall. Is. They just don't like the, they they don't don't like like the, the rhetoric. rhetoric and they yeah. don't like him. They, he's not being presidential and they yeah. can't stand it. And, uh, and I understand that school of thought, yeah. but you know what? That's part of that populist nature, too, yeah. of the president. You yeah. know? So. Well, hey, listen, uh, lawmakers aren't the only ones the president has called out in speeches and on Twitter. Well, that's right. You know, one of the prime targets has been uh, NBC, CBS, mm -hmm. CNN, the Alphabet Soup. They're all in there. And of course, as the president puts it, they're all. Fake, fake news. news. And I went like this. I went fake news. I know people would say, don't put the quotes, but I'm putting the quotes. I'm going to put the quotes. Put the quotes. Um, I think that's right, the fake news notion. But I think the question is, what can the president do to these outlets that he deems to be fake news? Now, we know that he's going to push back on Twitter. Sarah has said this over and over. He's going to push back on Twitter. But fake or fact, can the president do anything legally to the so-called fake news? I'm going to answer that question mm. on the other side of the break. This just in, President Trump isn't a fan of CNN or NBC, or you get the idea. Uh, but the POTUS turned his ire up a notch with this tweet. Network news has become so partisan, distorted, and fake that licenses must be challenged and, if appropriate, revoked. Not fair to the public. Which had a lot of us thinking, fake or fact, can the President of the United States actually revoke a news network's license? The President can challenge a license just as any public citizen can do. Um, he could write a letter to the FCC just like I could or just like you could write a letter to the FCC. Challenge, but not revoke. And there's another problem when it comes to network news specifically. Networks don't have licenses. Individual stations licenses. So the president can challenge an individual station's license on NBC, which could pose a problem for the Peacock Network, whose programs air on NBC affiliate stations across the country. But even then, it's up to the Federal Communications Commission, an independent agency made up of Democrats and Republicans. And according to one of those five commissioners, that's not how it works, and that's not what the FCC will be doing. So what can the president do when it comes to news networks that he deems are unfair or dishonest? In the past, the administration has hinted at opening up libel laws to make it easier to go after reporters using the court system. Because as it stands, libel would be a challenge for the president. There are obstacles when it comes to proving defamation. In particular, the burden of proof is higher for government officials. The president would have to prove that he has been damned in some way by a statement, by a tweet, or by a news coverage. It's very hard to prove that the president of the United States has been damaged by a statement that someone makes. His life is very open. That comes with the nature of the job. And typically, the higher one goes up the government food chain, i.e. the president of the United States, the less the courts are to rule in their favor. So the answer is fake. While the president can challenge a station's license, the networks themselves aren't licensed. And when it comes to revoking anything, that's up to the FCC. That's very good. Fake or fact, ladies and gentlemen. Fake. <laughs> it's fake. Fake, fake or fact. So the president can go after them mm -hmm. uh, via lawsuits and libel, which we've seen with Melania Trump in the Daily Mail earlier right. this yeah, year. Big time. Um, but as far as challenging a license, one, the networks don't have licenses. Mm -hmm. Two, the stations have licenses. And even if he does challenge, it still falls into the hands of the FCC on whether or not. They're going to pull a license. I wouldn't be yeah. surprised if he challenges them somewhere, somewhere, so somehow, some way in a court of law. I don't yeah. know. I, I mean, know. you know, challenge yeah. them would make a statement 
but I'm not sure it would make any kind of a if it would stand up. Effect. If but it would Trump stand up. Trump likes making yeah. statements. He does. Touché. He does. <laughs> Touche. You don't say. Touche. T O U C H E. Yeah. I don't know how to spell it. Mm -hmm. She's just, just, just for the accent. I'm just trying to help. Accent. I mean, accent. The e. <laughs> Is that an accent of goo? Whatever. I don't know what that means. Yeah. Well, everybody, that does it for Faith Nation this week. Yes. Yeah, so, so, by the way, make sure you tune in next week. Uh, we've got an interview. Boy, I'm going, growing a beard for this one. You know why. Get ready. In a week. Phil, Phil Robertson Rock. from <laughs> Duck Dynasty. He's joining us next week. I can't wait to have him here. I'm going to go duck hunting. That would be terrific. I want to go duck hunting. Hey, maybe that's another episode. Or maybe not. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.